All right. All right. Very good. Good. Yes. Can yes. I? Yes. Yes. All on. right. So, first of all, welcome everyone. Um, some of you know that we did the guest lecture yesterday at IHN at the Winford campus. And I probably forgot to mention to all of you that um, we will repeat the whole lecture in the evening. So I guess you've got the notice from Julia. So here I am. Um, some of you may have met me. I'm sure you have. Some may have not met me yet. But um, of course, my name is Edith Kunst, and I've been um, instructing pathology at both campuses of IHN for 16 years now. I graduated from IHN. I finished my program in 1999. And I've been in private clinical practice ever since. And the learning and the knowledge accumulation and the studies never end. Uh, for the past 20 years, I incorporated homeopathy, as well as herbal medicine, as well as, of course, lifestyle microscopy into my clinical practice. Uh, all the fundamentals that we learned at IHN and seen thousands and thousands of, of clients. And I can say that the best learning comes from experience and practice. So of course, I always say to my students in class, you have to start practicing, you have to start seeing clients, and you have to start learning by your experiences. So today, I'm going to um, talk about the tissue salts briefly, introduction of the um, tissue remedies, and also just, just going over a brief history of the tissue salts, how they are prepared, what is the benefit in clinical practice, especially relevance in nutritional clinical practice, and also for personal use as well. Uh, many of the remedies are used as first stage remedies for common ailments of headaches, sore throat, fever, children's ailments, and many of the remedies are incorporated in chronic um, clinical practice and chronic um, treatment as well. Um, I've been using the tissue salts personally for myself, as well as for, for recommending to my clients. And also just a quiz for the end of the session. Uh, once we went through a few of the tissue salts for the nervous system, uh, my question to you is, if you can guess what remedy I took before the lecture or before the seminar or webinar. Um, so I guess I can now start with the slides and um, start um, the lecture and the explanation on the tissue salts. Yes? Julia? Yes, absolutely. Okay, all right, all right, excellent. So here we have the, um, uh, the slides. And just give me one sec. So here we have. So of course, the uh, lecture is titled Introduction to the Biochemic Tissue Salts. Biochemic because they work by biochemistry in the body. And also, um, considering the brief history and the therapeutic usage of the, um, of the um, remedies, now I'm just, uh, just give me a sec. I just try to get to, here it is. So the remedies, 12 in numbers, otherwise also known as cell salts or Schussler salts or tissue salts. Schussler salts because Dr. Wilhelm Schussler was the one uh, experimenting and discovering, studying and utilizing these tissue salts, introducing them into common clinical practice in 1873 when he wrote our journal article based on his studies and experimentations and putting down his theory, the theoretical use of this biochemic system of medicine. So his theory was that all diseases were related to the deficiency of mineral salts in the body. Uh, considering that we study nutrition and the fundamentals of nutrition, and we study minerals and vitamins and supplements and how they work in the body, and also the biochemical, um, the biochemical effects at the cellular level, then this discovery of Dr. Schussler was quite revolutionary at the time. He was a medical doctor, he studied medicine, he studied biochemistry, which was called at the time physiological chemistry, and also physics. So he studied many, many um, modalities, and of course he practiced many modalities. Um, so of course, looking at the biochemic remedies, um, what he said that these biochemic remedies are part of our cells and part of our tissues, as well as the body fluids. Remedies made from mineral compounds, we will have a list of those mineral compounds that they are made of, and usually numbered from one to 12, generally used in the six X potency. So that's the most common potency being utilized, but sometimes the 3x or 12x potency. Uh, what the x means, it means the decimal dilution. So we will go through the process of dilution. 
solution and preparation, or these tissue salts are paid as compressed triturated tablets, which are made from largely insoluble minerals, and they are blended and ground into a diluent substance. In this case, the diluent substance is lactose. It's a solid substance, it's not liquid, as opposed to making homeopathic remedies by liquid dilutions. So the solid substance, lactose, is utilized to grind and triturate the inorganic, insoluble mineral compounds. Here is the list of the 12 solids. And when we look at the names, generally listed on the labels of the remedies. Let's say calcarea sulfurica, which is generally number one on the list if we go by the list by numbers, which is nothing more or nothing else than calcium sulfate. So it's made from calcium sulfate, which is the inorganic compound. Calcarea florica is made from calcium fluoride, or basically it's calcium fluoride. Calcarea phosphorica or calcarea phosphoricum is calcium phosphate. Ferrum phosphate is phosphate. Calcium phosphoricum is potassium phosphate. So we look at the Latin names of the mineral elements and then adding the name of the compound, generally phosphorus or sulfur or, or salt. Muriaticum is, let's say, uh, when we look at natrium muriaticum, it's sodium fluoride. So it's a homeopath homeopathic potentization of pure, plain sodium fluoride. So the history here again, Samuel Hahnemann was the father of homeopathy. And as we look at his birth date, 1755, and his death uh, date, which is 1843, he lived a long, healthy life, which was kind of unusual at the time in the late 18th. Sent homeopathy besides besides uh, because he couldn't make enough money by practicing conventional medicine of the time. So then, translating one of the herbal books, he came across a remedy, which uh, he became interested in, and eventually this remedy became one of the major remedies of the Materia Medica, which uh, was the beginning of his proving practices and developing of of homeopathic medicine or homeopathic remedies. And even he expected Schusler's the uh, theory of the biochemic system of, of medicine of the time. And he said, all constituents of the human body principally act on those organs wherein they have a function and all fulfill their functions when they are the cause of symptoms. So what he meant, all physiological substances are necessary in the proper amount in the physical body. And if there is a derangement on this proportion or ratio or otherwise homeostasis or equilibrium, disease will develop. And curing and reversing those disease conditions, we need to replenish and replace the necessary substances to maintain that homeostasis. So then Schusler of Oldenburg was the medical doctor, as I mentioned before, and that was, uh, he was the main pioneer of the biochemic system of medicine and biochemistry, and also the force behind the development and elaboration of the importance of the 12 tissue salts, as well as studying their pathogenic effects in excessive amounts, and well, as well as therapeutic usage in the necessary dilutions and potencies. So 1873 was the year when he published this paper in the um, uh, abridged homeopathic therapeutics. And it was obviously published in German language. And what he wrote when he published this paper that about a year ago, a year ago, I endeavored to discover by experience on the sick, if it were not possible to heal them, provided their diseases were curable at all, with those substances that are the natural, such as physiological functioning remedies, then the sickness can be reversed and the sick can be cured. And according to his theory, any disturbance in the molecular motion of the cell salts in living tissues caused by a deficiency in the requisite amounts constitutes disease. And that is what he was trying to address and reverse and obviously help the sick. So the biotherapeutics or biochemic therapeutics are based on the principle that the integrity, the structure, the function of the body's tissues and organs 
or dependent on the necessary quantities of cell source. The biochemic system of medicine recognizes the importance of the inorganic constituents within the cells of the body. Um, just a bit of a recap of uh, the kind of the biochemic components of cells. So when we look at the cell in the human body or animal cells, you're looking at the, of course, the cell nucleus, the organelles, the cytoplasm, the cytoplasm, which is also called the protoplasm. The cytoplasm uh, contains a lot of dissolved substances, some organic containing carbon atoms, and many inorganic substances, such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, mineral electrolyte elements, either in compounds or in ionic, uh, ionic forms. We also know, for example, the ionic concentration of calcium and potassium differs within the cells intracellularly or extracellularly in the interstitial fluid, as well as, of course, the extracellular fluid, which is one of the extracellular fluids is the blood in the blood circulatory system. So the proper balance and the movement of these uh, electrolytes and biochemical compounds always have to be regulated by the regulatory mechanism of the hormonal or endocrine system, as well as, of course, the nervous system, and of course, the regulatory organs, such as the kidneys, the liver, the circulatory system. And what we know now about biochemistry and the cellular components and cellular uh, biochemistry and physiologic chemistry, then we have a huge amount of knowledge connecting what he studied at the time and the relevance of the information from his time to today's knowledge of science of cellular physiology as well as cellular anatomy. So then what he also knew at the time that the cell salts are the integral functioning parts of each individual cell and also the body as a whole. It is the theory of this health system that should a deficiency occur in one or more of the tissue salts of the body, a form of disease state would arise in the body. So according to biochemic therapeutics, every abnormal condition in the body is a result of a lack of some inorganic cellular salt. Health and energy can be maintained so long as all of the cellular tissue salts in the body are properly maintained. So then the inorganic constituents of the cells, as I mentioned, here we have, for example, nerve tissue, nerve cells, the brain itself, all with its supportive cells of the neuroglia cells, for example, contain magnesium, calcium or potassium, as well as sodium or natrium, as well as iron in some components. So here it is what he studied and discovered that these tissues contain significant amounts in certain ratios of these inorganic elements. And obviously we have to constantly replenish the elements in order to maintain the homeostasis or equilibrium and proper physiological functions. Muscle cells, for example, contain the same composition, magnesium, potassium, sodium, iron, with the addition of potassium chloride, for example. Connective tissue cells also contain quite a significant amount of the above mentioned mineral compounds, as well as silica compounds in tiny minute trace amounts. And also, especially in elastic tissues of the body, such as tendons, ligaments, the elastic um, protein generation of the skin containing calcarea fluorica or calcium fluoride. So the aim of the biochemical system of medicine of his um, discovery is to cover a deficiency directly. As nutritional practitioners, we cover deficiencies by nutritional supplementation. We do the proper nutritional assessments for deficiency symptoms. We recommend dietary intake of certain uh, food for the specific nutrients that is needed to combat or reverse the deficiency. But we also have to take into consideration that sometimes the dose makes the difference and how it gets to the cells. So how these compounds get to the cells of the body, how they are absorbed, how they are assimilated, and the waste excreted, and how they are moving between different compartments of the body. So compartments, the fluid compartments, such as the intracellular, the extracellular, the interstitial fluid compartments, all have to maintain the proper ratio of the balance of the mineral elements, as well as 
water as the body water compartments and um, constantly maintaining the diffusion, the facilitated transport, as well as the um, spontaneous movement of the fluids, as well as the electrolytes. So the biochemic remedies, as they are administered in minimal dosages, corresponding to the proper ratios within cellular and extracellular fluids, are going to have to maintain and reestablish the equilibrium of the system. Um, another comment on, um, on uh, of course, the nutritional components that, let's say, for example, we recommend calcium supplementation or magnesium supplementation. And sometimes certain people cannot assimilate, either because of digestive system issues, diseases or elements or challenges of, let's say, um, digestive enzyme secretions or surgical interventions or medications, interventions or medications, side effects, and also some contraindications with certain medications. So we know many people take prescription medications. Prescription medications come with a lot of contraindications regarding nutritional supplements, herbal remedies especially, and we have to be cautious. We have to be aware of the contraindications and have to be um, sure that what we are recommending is not going to harm the person and it's not going to go against the effect of the prescription medication, for example. So in this case, when we look at the um, tissue salts or the cell salts, the minute dilutions easily assimilable through the oral mucosa entering to the body fluids and eventually shifting between the fluid compartments of the body are safe in all cases of all ages, uh, during pregnancy, lactation, infancy, old age, people taking prescription medications or undergoing certain types of um, um, medical treatments, such as chemotherapy, for example, or even radiation treatment. So these remedies are absolutely safe with no side effects, no um, overdose symptoms, and no contraindications from prescription medications or no contraindications um, with even other remedies or other herbal substances. And also when people practice classical homeopathy, often try to avoid the um, addition of either nutritional supplements or substances, or even more than one or two remedies at the time. The tissue salts have been combined quite successfully with the classical homeopathic or constitutional treatment as well. So looking at the preparation and the dose utilization of the remedies, so the crude chemical compound, which is insoluble, doesn't dissolve in water, doesn't dissolve in alcohol, needs to be blended with the lactose I mentioned before. So trituration is the process of the dilution or the blending and mixing of the original starting inorganic compound. And that could be, let's say, for example, calcarea phosphorica, which is calcium phosphate. So one part of the original substance is added to nine parts of lactose and ground for hours, generally for two hours. And of course, the addition of this one part is gradual to the nine parts. So the nine parts addition is gradual to the original starting substance. And it takes quite a while. So it's time consuming. Once this uh, trituration process is complete, for the first step of the dilution, then we will get the first decimal trituration, which is denoted by 1x. In this case, x means the Roman numeral 10. So it's the decimal series of dilution. So 1x potency means that the original substance is present in the dilution one in one tenth of a ratio of, of course, the original substance in ratio to the diluent substance. The second step is going to be taking one part of this 1x potency done by the trituration process and mixing it with nine parts of the diluent lactose, again, for a couple of hours grinding in a mortar pestle um, system. And then once the proper blending and mixing and grinding and distribution of the molecules with the lactose, is done, then we have the 2x potency or the second decimal dilution. And it goes on and on and on, arriving at the 3x potency or the third decimal dilution, or going on to the 6x decimal potency, and sometimes even to the 12x dilution.
So Dr. Schuster's experience has shown that even this minute subdivision is sometimes too gross or too concentrated. So the trituration and the subdivising process has to be kept up even further. So that's why the sixth potency is most often utilized. Sometimes the 12th, uh, the 12th X potency is utilized in certain cases in certain um, examples of the remedies. And also many, uh, of course, the, uh, the biggest challenge for practitioners is the dosage and the frequency of the repetition. So in this case, with the minute dilutions, it's not the amount that counts, it's the frequency of repetition. And when we are looking at age, uh, let's say children, infants, let's say there's a six month old child and we need some of the remedies for, let's say, fever or restlessness. And we consider giving the child one tablet. So that would be the amount of a dose. So one tablet of the compressed tablets would be given to the child, either put under the tongue or on the tongue or diluted in a small amount of water, maybe in a teaspoon of water, the tablet is dissolving and that can be given to children. Of course, infants, we have to be cautious of what kind of water we give them uh, before the age of six months. Generally, distilled water is recommended if we give them water at all. Uh, aside uh, breast milk, of course, but once they start eating solid food, then um, distilled or pure water is quite safe. Between one and five years of age, the dose remains the same, one tablet. So that would be considered one dose. Between six to 11 years or six to 12, generally two tablets of the remedy is given as one dose. 12 years and over and adults, we consider four tablets to be a dose. And uh, as I mentioned before, general for children under the age of five or infants, we like to dissolve the tablets to prevent any suffocation or inhalation of the substance, uh, the best way to administer in water dilution. And how frequently would we repeat the dosage? So remember, children generally one to two tablets, adults three, four, even five tablets oftentimes. It depends on the size of the tablet. It depends on the manufacturer. It depends on the um, compression of the tablet, how quickly it dissolves, how quickly it falls apart. Then um, uh, in acute cases, when we look at uh, an acute condition, for example, sore throat or fever or headache, or stomach pain, or cramping, or even in the case of um, female issues, menstrual cramps, or pregnancy-related spasms of the um, abdominal muscles, or tension of the ligaments, or extreme laxity of the ligaments. So in this case, if there is an acute manifestation of any type of ailment, then we like to repeat very frequently. So the dose would be repeated every hour or two in general. For severe acute conditions, let's say if it's a fever of a child, or if it's a severe headache or menstrual cramps, we can repeat the dose every 15 minutes. So for adults, again, three, four tablets every 15 minutes until the pain subsides or until the remedy is not needed as frequently anymore. So of course, it's always monitoring the signs and the symptoms and the sensations and how the person feels, what the person feels. In subacute cases, we usually repeat three, four times a day. Could be every two hours, every three hours, depending on the severity of the, of the symptoms and the signs and the suffering and the discomfort. And in chronic affections, the general repetition is three, maybe four times a day. So again, depending on age, two to four tablets, and also the frequency is determined by the severity of the suffering or the severity of the discomfort. Um, I also have um, some, um, some, some of the remedies that I'm, I'm carrying in my office, and of course I'm recommending some of them, so I don't know how uh, well you see. Uh, different brands um, have different sized tablets, also different, um, uh, what do I have? I have Califos, I have Califos, of course. These are the two nerve remedies that I'm going to, I mean, one of the nerve remedies that I'm going to talk about. So um, what I generally care is the Unda brand. So the Unda brand, of course, easily available when people have accounts for the um, uh, Genestra brand products. And um, they generally come in six uh, X potencies, but, but you can also also order three X or 12 X potencies. Home you can is another manufacturer in Canada. They also have the tissue salts or the 12. And the tablets, I find um, in the case of homeocan tablets, tablets are slightly bigger and they are not dissolving as quickly and as easily as, for example, the Recovec, the Dr. Recovec brand. 
And I'm not a representative of any of the companies, so I'm not a sales rep, not a brand ambassador for any of the um, uh, companies or the manufacturers, but these are the ones that I had experience with over the uh, 20 years. So here we have also the Dr. Rekovec brand. The tablets are uh, slightly smaller, um, instantaneously dissolving. Many people prefer this brand. Some people prefer the Homeocan brand. So sometimes it depends what they start for the first time and what they have positive experiences with they like to stick with the same brand but other than that the preparation is the same the uh, the manufacturing follows the same principles and the regulations and the ingredients are also in the uh, same ratios and the proper amounts uh, tablet by tablet and of course also keep in mind that uh, in the case of the um, um, homeopathic remedies or tissue salts it's not the amount that counts, it's the frequency of repetition. So um, let's just go through three of the most commonly used tissue salts or cell salts, especially the ones relevant for nervous system tonification and of course for students, memory enhancement, and also even just calming the mind after a whole night of studying for a test or even stage fright or the anxiety of anticipation of the oncoming test, for example, or submitting the assignments on time and doing the research and, um, and, and enhancing the neurological connections and the synapses in the brain. So here we have Calcarea phosphorica, which is probably the most commonly used remedies and that calcarea phosphorica is made from calcium phosphate so calcium phosphate is insoluble it's an inorganic mineral compound and what calcarea phosphorica is considered to be is the ideal of tonic at all life stages from the moment of birth or even before birth throughout late stages of life because it's a general tonifier of the whole system, not just the nervous system, and also especially relevant in growth stages of children, fetal development during gestational development, as well as old age, especially postmenopausal uh, issues with absorption, assimilation, mineralization, or mineral loss, or reduced ability to assimilate the nutrients due to shrinkage of all cells in the body, especially the digestive mucosa cells. So here we have calcarea phosphorica. Of course, we have the mineral uh, sign for calcium phosphate. It's the general nutrient, the ideal tonic. And the description of this remedy is that it's the most widely spread mineral element in the body. And it's found in all tissues, especially in solid tissues of the body, connective tissues, the bones, especially. We know calcium is stored as phosphate compounds in the bones on the bone matrix. And calcarea phosphoricus action is closely related to development of nerve tissues, as well as bone tissues and muscle tissues and any supportive tissues of the body, even within the cells, the cellular skeleton of the cells need the calcium uh, compounds. Pregnancy and growth stages, as I mentioned before, especially. So when we look at a pregnant mom who perhaps gets to the third trimester of pregnancy, and of course that baby is pushing the stomach and it's squeezing everything in the abdominal area, even the thoracic cavity is pressurized. And oftentimes the pregnant mom has no appetite or cannot eat enough in order to maintain the proper nutrient intake. And maybe for some reason, the pregnant mom becomes nauseous and maybe vomits in the last trimester of pregnancy or towards the end stages of pregnancy. So we have to make sure nutrients are absorbed appropriately. And especially the growth and the building types of nutrients are assimilated and um, adequately taken in. So here we have the use of the tissue salt, calcarea phosphorica, which is not requiring the digestive process. So again, keep in mind, the assimilation and the absorption takes place through the oral mucosa. No digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid, pancreatic enzymes, but is required for the assimilation. And of course, the tiny amounts will pass through the oral mucosa to the extracellular fluids, being picked up by the capillaries, delivered in the blood to the proper cells and tissues, and taken up by the cells into the intracellular compartment. 
So here we have the remedy. Um, again, the relevance, all life stages, the general tonic, and also specifically relevant for the nervous system because we know the nervous system won't work without calcium. If you have taken pathology um, in the um, nervous system segment, we discussed calcium's role as calming the membrane's um, receptors as well as calming the neurological membrane on the extracellular compartment. And just in case calcium ions are in inadequate amounts, then we have spontaneous discharges of the nerve cells or the neurons and spasms are initiated. So spastic sustained muscular contractions due to the inadequate extracellular calcium. So that's when we experience the muscle spasms during the night, we wake up with the calf spasm, or maybe the bottom of the feet or the toes, when inadequate extracellular calcium is, of course, inadequate calcium. <laughs> so here we have um, calcareophosphoric. Now in the case of, of utilization as the tissue salt or the homeopathic cell salt, we are looking at specific indicators. And the specific indicators can be listed as keynote symptoms or indicators as signs and symptoms in general. So when you're looking at, let's say a chart, he does not grow appropriately because if the chart has no appetite, not eating enough, not eating the proper combinations, and they just do not grow as they should be according to the growth charts, especially if it's a young child, let's say a toddler. So when we have unnatural growth, and disturbances of the solidity of the bones, for example, or resistance of the tissues, then that is the consideration to add that particular tissue salt. And of course, children have not always um, easy times taking supplements, and uh, sometimes it's not even recommended to give supplements to young children. So deficient calcium assimilation with children, and what we see in um, either infants or toddlers, uh, infants have the fontanelles, so the bones of the um, uh, skull bone are not fully joined and ossified. So we have that little soft spot, or they have the little so soft spot at the top of their heads. And if they remain open too long, they do not ossify. Generally by the end of age one, or generally by age one, uh, then that would be kind of like a warning sign to consider some mineralization remedies, either increasing calcium contents of their food and also adding maybe some assimilable supplements. But of course, for the safest choice, we may choose calcarea phosphorica, for example. Dental development, eruptions of teeth, if there is delayed dental development, consideration for calcarea phosphorica is number one. Also rickets. So we discussed rickets. We know those who took pathology hopefully remember still. Rickets is bone deformity of children caused by vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D, we know the role of vitamin D and of course the sunlight or the supplementation of vitamin D. But vitamin D alone is not always enough. We still need the mineral compounds, we still need the calcium, and of course the supportive cofactors, enzyme cofactors accompanying the calcium either through food or supplementation. So here we have the utilization of calcarea phosphorica and its role is to enhance the assimilation of calcium through the digestive tract, the movement of the calcium compounds between the body fluid compartments, and of course, at the end, arriving at the proper destination of cells of the bones or the teeth of the fingernails or the hair, or of course, even connective tissues and especially the nervous system. Uh, in cases of digestive disturbances, such as people having um, digestive issues, also looking at not just um, internal enzyme secretion difficulties or, or blockages or reduction or, or decline, but also displacement of internal organs. So that could be the laxity of the ligaments. And often people suffer prolapses. So prolapse meaning shrinkage, of the um, organ from its proper position. It could be a prolapse of the transverse colon. It could be the prolapse of the stomach. It could be also the prolapse of the uterus, especially in uh, middle age or postmenopausal or sometimes even premenopausal. So here we have the organ displacements, one consideration for enhancing the strength and the uh, supportive nature of connective tissues, um, internal organs, consideration for calcarea phosphorica. 
And also keep in mind all these um, uh, situations that were mentioned require the chronic dosing. So the chronic dosing would be three times a day between two to four pallets or uh, two to four tablets taken into the mouth, dissolved on or under the tongue, and uh, generally away from food. Uh, the strict recommendation would be half an hour before or after meals, but in immediate urgent cases or first aid nature of requirements, uh, it doesn't even matter. As long as the mouth is rinsed and there is no significant lingering flavors or residues or particles of food in the mouth, we can put the, uh, put the um, uh, tablets on the tongue and it, it does not even, um, it is not required to bathe the half an hour. Um, another one, which is having specific relevance for the nervous system, magnesia phosphorica. So magnesia phosphorica is the best friend of females in all stages of life, but also children, as well as irritable males, for example. So magnesia phosphorica is the nerve stabilizer, especially considered to, um, considered to be used in spasmodic um, conditions, spasms of the muscles or painful spasms or darting pains or cramps or even neuralgia or nerve pain, sometimes even nerve inflammation, but especially chronic pain or sudden pain or, or unexpected darting spastic pain. And also mentioning flatulence, which is not considered to be pain or a first aid situation but the flatulence with the associated discomfort of distension and the um, occasional cramping pain of this bloatedness, uncomfortable sensation. So magnesia phosphorica would be the best anti-spasmodic remedy by stabilizing the nerve impulses, especially of the motor neurons, as well as the sensory neurons. Also, looking at the description, so magnesia phosphorica found in quite a significant amount in the blood and the extracellular body fluids, because we know magnesium, magnesium is um, present in higher concentration in certain compartments of the body, but also of course blood as the highway of delivering nutrients carries a significant amount of magnesium. But also we find magnesium intracellularly and intracellular extracellular balance has to be maintained at all times. So also um, uh, magnesium phosphorica or magnesium, magnesium phosphate is found in bones, teeth, in the spine, obviously the nervous system, the spinal cord, as well as the brain and the supporting cells of the nervous system. And also um, looking at indications. So what would be the clinical or practical indication for the usage or choosing magnesium phosphorica as a tissue cell? Um, when a person is really exhausted and has no, not enough reserve energy. Also the possibility of this exhaustion in older age. Also sudden lack of nerve power and sudden uh, sensation of exhaustion. Also spastic, colicky, abdominal pain in teething children. Infants, for example, when they are teething, often uh, parents see the child pulling the knees to the chest and suffering from cramps and discomfort and loss of appetite, maybe vomiting, maybe diarrhea. So that would be also a consideration. So remember calcarea, uh, calcarea phosphorica for the connective tissues, structural components, bones, teeth, and also enhancement of ossification of the bones could be combined with magnesia phosphorica for helping teeth eruptions and dentition and formation of the dental enamel, but also um, magnesia phosphorica for calming that irritated, agitated chart during teething. Also, here is the list of whooping cough from the original Materium Medica of, of Schusler, uh, which is in the book. So I'm going to show you the book as well. So this is the um, publication that is listing the um, original information from Schusler. So it's by um, Boricki and Dewey. And of course, it's, it's written in the language of the time, of the, um, of the, of the early I mean, the late um, 19th century. So it's, it's using archaic language. Sometimes it's very funny and sometimes it's hard to understand. So that's why we have the homeopathic um, 
dictionary or dictionary of homeopathic medicine, which is also, um, oh, I just, uh, oh, quickly I can't find it. But there's an actual, what it is, <laughs> homeopathic dictionary to understand the terms of the time of the 18th um, uh, century and the 19th century. And of course, what, uh, what language was used at the time and how these books were written. So nevertheless, uh, Bukhinkov is listed in the original uh, public publication. And it's not for the infection. So magnesia phosphorica is not an anti-infectious remedy. It's not for infection or combating bacterial or viral infections or enhancement of the immune system, but it is for the spasm. It's for the spasm of the upper as well as the lower respiratory tract. So it helps to calm the child and of course that uh, spastic uh, contraction of, of the throat and of course the trachea and the bronchi in the case of, of any types of respiratory uh, affections and infections. Also, of course, the mental fear not associated with whooping cough, obviously. Also writer's cramps, colics of different types or abdominal cramps, intestinal stomach cramps, as well as spasmodic abdominal pains and also back pain, which tends to be spasmodic. So of course, um, lots of people suffer from low back pain or, or upper back pain, and the muscles are tense and spastic. And of course, benefiting from massage and chiropractic adjustments and different types of manipulations, but the muscles still need to relax. So that is the major consideration for magnesia phosphorica. So here is the um, listing in red, which everybody should remember, the antispasmodic remedy, as well as um, dealing with exaggerated irritability and especially menstrual cramps. I want to uh, share a bit of a therapeutic um, recommendation for menstrual cramps for menstruating women. Uh, it doesn't matter when the, uh, when the cramps are the worst on the first day or the second day or the last day or the day before. Uh, the menstrual cramps, obviously, people experiencing it know how bad they can be. So here is the uh, utilization of magnesia phosphorica for the, for the menstrual cramps. Uh, magnesia phosphorica is one of the tissue salts that is best taken in warm water, diluted in a glass of uh, apparently hot water, which is the original recommendation. Obviously not boiling hot, drinkable hot, like a cup of tea, for example. So we take a cup of uh, warm water as if it was tea, put in maybe 10 tablets of the tissue salts, stir with a spoon, let it dissolve. Once it's dissolved, we take a sip every five minutes, for example, sometimes even every minute. Taking a sip of the dilution or using a spoon, stirring each time before we take the remedy and take a spoonful of the uh, solution into the mouth, holding it for a minute and then swallowing and repeating every one, every five, maybe every 10 minutes. So generally for um, women experience, experience, experiencing menstrual pain, um, following through this process of diluting in warm water, taking the water as if it was tea, uh, by the end of finishing the cup of water, the pain subsides. And generally the um, kind of, <laughs> Not everybody is responding. So not 100% of people will respond with the same results. I would say probably 10% of people suffering or having menstrual pain, menstrual cramps are not going to respond to this um, remedy. Uh, but I would say probably 80, 90% generally benefit from taking this totally safe, non-toxic, um, non-overdosable remedy and getting the benefit of calming the nerves, relaxing the muscles, having less pain. If, just in case, the pain does not subside significantly by the end of finishing that one cup of dilution, then repeat, repeat again, repeat as long as needed. And eventually, generally I would say by the end of the first cup of the hot water dilution with the magnesium phosphorica inside is going to be giving significant relief from the menstrual cramps. Um, uh, what else? Um, magnesia phosphorica. So I think, I think that that's the biggest, um, kind of the, the biggest and most common usage for, uh, for cramps and abdominal pains, but it could be also pain and cramps of, of, um, let's say irritable bowel syndrome or other types of intestinal disturbances or even injuries or muscle tension or 
ligament uh, extensions and then spasms follow injuries, for example. So that would be uh, that would be the consideration. And of course, for the nervous system, also relevant to students, when your brain is overworked and exhausted and you still cannot go to sleep because the brain just keeps going and going and going and there's no rest and no relaxation, especially useful to take the magnesia phosphorica, also the same way as if it was taken for the menstrual pain. So dilute in a glass of hot water or cup of hot water and take that dilution or solution as if it was your good night tea or nighty night tea, for example. Going on to, um, of course, the summarization of the specific um, symptoms associated with the um, requirement for magnesium phosphoric uh, exhaustion with cramps or pains or even convulsive pains or spasms, especially when the pains are shooting and they are intermittent and generally relieved by pressure and warmth, like a warm compress on the painful side and generally aggravated by cold and slight touch. So here is kind of the difference between uh, modalities. Pressure, compression, heavier pressure helps to reduce the pain, but light touch irritates. So that's the high irritability and uh, agitation of the nervous system. So again, uh, here is uh, the statement at the bottom, the remedy works best when given in hot water. And let's just look at the next one, calium phosphoricum which is a specifically beneficial nutrients for all students. I probably mentioned it at the beginning of the pathology class, introduction of some of the um, uh, supplements for brain function enhancement, as well as uh, memory enhancement. So Califos or cal Calium Phosphoricum or otherwise Potassium Phosphate is the specific nerve nutrient. So this is the remedy everybody should consider having on the desk or in the cupboard or in the purse when they are exhausting themselves and getting to the end of their ropes as well. So nervous exhaustion in general. Also nervous indigestion, when we are nervous and excited or agitated or irritated and the digestive system is not functioning appropriately. So we can consider calming and tonifying the nerves with calcium phosphoricum. Nervous headaches, for example, and especially exhaustion. So the nervous exhaustion. So here is the description. Calcium phosphoricum is found in nerve tissues, nerve cells, in the brain and supportive cells, also in the blood and the muscles. So again, this is an element or compound that is widely distributed in the body. Symptoms of deficiency of potassium particularly, but of course symptoms of deficiency of the tissue salt, which would be not the correct term to use, but the indication for the usage of the tissue salt. Depression, depressive states, not the deep clinical mental depression, but the depression because of the anxieties or the exhaustion. So it's more of, of the exhausted, or exhaust, uh, like exhaustive depression. It's not bipolar disorders, it's not bipolar depression, but it's just that low exhausted mood, the lack of energy, which is not the physical energy, but it's the brain or the nerve energy. Anxiety, the unexplainable fears and tension and tightness of the stomach and, and the excitement or anticipation of some oncoming events and also disturbances arising from lack of the nerve energy. So here are, again, um, the list of the indications. Neurasthenia, which is lack of the nerve energy, fatigue, consequences of illness, specifically in, um, in cases of long, drawn out, chronic or acute infections, and in the recuperation or the convalescence period. Also, overstrain of the mind and exhaustion and the vertigo associated with the exhaustion. So this is not the vertigo of the inner ear imbalance or let's say uh, sclerosis of the capillaries leading to the nerves of the inner ear apparatus or the auditory nerves or calcification of the auditory um, nerves. But it's the vertigo or the um, kind of the dizziness, the spaciness of exhaustion. So that would be something that we didn't have a good night's sleep. Uh, we stayed up all night, either studying or partying or working, or just just uh, we had a restless night. And the next day we felt spacey and dizzy, and and the world is 
turning around us. So that would be the consideration for a nerve tonification, utilizing calcium phosphoricum. Spasms as well, paralysis, sensation of extreme weakness, which is not muscular weakness, it's neurological nerve uh, exhaustion and nerve weakness. All cases of innervation, meaning lack of the proper nerve stimulus and nerve energy and the nerve impulse conduction. Consequences of arterial sclerosis leading to senescence or dementia. Again, it's not the, um, uh, not the particular arterial sclerosis process that it's aiming to support or reverse, but it's the consequence of the reduced blood supply to the nerve tissues. And also, even in cases of hypertension or high blood pressure, then no organic or mechanical cause is found. So again, the example, stress the effects of chronic or acute short-term stress definitely creates vasospasms, vascular constriction, um, anxiety sensations, or irritability sensations that will definitely affect the adrenal hormonal regulatory mechanism, regulating vasospasms, vasoconstriction, maybe sodium retention, um, maybe um, retention of water through the kidneys, because of the effects of stress and the adrenal glands and adrenal hormones responses. So here we have the um, kind of the tonifying and calming effect from Calipos. And um, what I would like to mention also, I do not have, I have the slides, but I was not planning to present those slides today because I, I wanted to focus on the neurological uh, remedies and neurological support. But the relevance of ferrum phosphoricum, which is iron phosphate, especially at this time of the year, and especially with the um, epidemic or the pandemic of the coronavirus outbreak and infections of different kinds, then ferrum phosphoricum would be your home remedy to keep at all times because ferrum phosphoricum is the remedy to utilize in cases of fever, infections, and especially the first stages of inflammation. So ferrum phosphoricum, iron phosphate, not just uh, addressing signs and symptoms or, or causes of anemia or iron assimilation, but also the mineral compound or the diluted um, homeopathically prepared tissue salt is uh, absolutely the number one first aid remedy for, um, for addressing and suppressing, not, I shouldn't say suppressing, but kind of working with fevers and um, calming the fevers and calming the inflammation. So we have the um, homeopathy for beginners starting next Tuesday evening. We have seven sessions on Tuesday evening, starting on February 11th until March 31st. Of course, March break is, is not part of the, um, uh, of the uh, we are away in March break. So we have seven sessions and the seven sessions are divided like um, the introduction to homeopathy and homeopathic principles, as well as of course, some of the, um, uh, and some of the laws of homeopathy and different types of um, discussions on terminology. So that would be the first, uh, first class. And we cover the 50 most commonly used remedies. So of course we cover the names, we cover um, what they are made from, how they are prepared, and what they are used for, especially in the case of either first aid or sometimes even in chronic uh, cases. So that will take, um, two, three sessions to cover. And also um, what I have the course outline here in front of me, in session four, we have more of the therapeutics. So the acute, um, acute treatment of colds and cough, influenza, hay fever, allergies, digestive um, disturbances, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting, including of course, morning sickness, motion sickness, and infectious uh, conditions associated with diarrhea, for example. And, um, and then uh, session five, six, seven covers the tissue salts in greater detail. So that's when we are looking at the um, whole list of all the 12 tissue salts, the clinical applications, therapeutic utilizations, uh, material medical symptoms, uh, differentiation, which ones to use, how to combine, and also um, most likely we have time to cover the facial characteristics, what is the manifestation of the deficiency of, let's say, magnesia phosphorica or natrium muriaticum. And, um, and yes, that's, that's the seven, uh, seven session course. 
which again, the relevance of the course, sometimes um, people have kind of doubts and questions, why is it that it would be useful to take the course? Um, it's not going to get you ready to practice as a classical homeopath, as a constitutional therapist, but it's going to get you to the point of understanding ingredients of remedies that you use already. So many nutritional practitioners use the under drainage remedies or the detoxification remedies, the compounds that are made up of five, six different um, dilution, uh, diluted remedies. Uh, for example, if you look at the under liver kidney drainage remedies or some of the combination remedies, even from the Dr. Rekovec brand, numbered by numbers or named by numbers that have ingredients and have the um, homeopathically diluted herbal components. So even like the Unda remedies, there are, I don't know, 200 or 300 remedies. It takes years to learn all uh, what they do, what we can utilize them for. But knowing the ingredients, let's say looking at, I mentioned Nox vomica, maybe Bryonia, maybe um, Chalidonium, maybe um, Sulfuricum, some, something. Do you recognize that all these remedies are having the affinity for the liver, for the digestive system, for detoxification? So that is how we can even recognize what the remedy is for, meaning the compound or complex remedy, but it would be used. So even if you do not memorize the thousand numbers of let's say the Recovec brand or the physical energetics or the Unda brands of remedies, looking at the label, we recognize and we know this uh, component of the homeopathic component is for the liver or it has affinity for the kidneys or for the nerves and the nervous system or the muscles or the digestive system. So that, that is what I find. And of course, a lot of previous uh, participants took on and went on to the college and studied the full program and became successful clinical homeopathic practitioners as well. So that's why it's truly called introduction or homeopathy for beginners or introduction to homeopathy. Yes. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Edith. I'm just sure. gonna check um, if there are any other questions. Uh, mostly comments, thank you. Excellent as always. Thank sure. you, yes, as uh, helps. Informative presentation. Good, good. So, so everything you again. is... Yes, all of you. And thank you for uh, spending the time. Good. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so right. we'll uh, be able to share this with those who weren't, be, uh, weren't able to attend. So I appreciate yes. you um, uh, having us record it. And that's great. I'm just going to see if there's just one more question. But okay. I think we are good. Oh, no. Just somebody saying thank you so much. Excellent. <laughs> um, Excellent. As, they're, as they're signing off. Okay. Right. Excellent. All right. Sure. Thank you. Everybody have a good night. Okay. Good night. Right. Bye, Julia. Bye-bye. Good night.